My name is Charles Head. I am the uh, head of services delivery for IBIS. We're a uh, Microsoft partner. Obviously, we do um, a primarily AX implementations. It's you know it's my job to to make sure that our implementations are done according to standards um, that are consistent across uh, all the various types of business units that we support. We've been a Microsoft partner for quite a while. We've been around since 1989. Uh, we've done hundreds of implementations. Uh, we primarily started as a GP practice. Uh, we switched over to AX back in the uh, early 2000s. We have uh, developed uh, distribution-focused ISV products. Um, so we're a, a leader in the uh, distribution channel for Microsoft. Uh, we were recently purchased by Sonata Software. They're one of the um, primary engineering support offshore resources for Microsoft. They've got like 600 engineers that work for Microsoft. They um, helped develop a lot of the AX7 uh, toolkits. They developed LCS. They uh, developed a lot of the tools that are used in Azure for managing the Azure platform. Um, they they uh, purchased us because we have a lot of expertise at doing implementations for um, AX. Um, and our ISV product is a, in addition to their uh, retail ISV product, Brick and Click. So our advanced supply chain solution, which is focused at the distribution industry, um, it goes well with their retail product, which is e-commerce and um, you know, retail additions to the base AX software. So together, we've got thousands of resources around the world to do implementations. Um, we have a lot of deep knowledge in uh, AX, AX7, 2012, in Azure, and the entire Microsoft stack, Office 365, Power BI. We think the new latest Microsoft products, the Azure, AX7 in particular, are incredible products that um, everybody needs to look at and they need to seriously consider for use in their, in their business. I'm going to briefly talk about the client where we implemented AX7 and then we're going to talk about um, what is AX7, how does it differ from the previous AX2012, why does it differ and what does that mean when you're trying to implement it. I know a lot of people are talking about going to AX7 or interested in maybe implementing portions of it, which means you probably want to know a little more about uh, what is it, how does it work, and how does that impact an implementation project. So they asked me to talk about that today. And since we just finished a large one, I figure I'll, I'll talk about that. And finally, I'm going to talk about Azure and living with Azure in um, an ADFS integrated environment. Um, it's an interesting topic, but it gets a little technical sometimes. So to understand our AX implementation, we have to do a, talk a little bit about the client we implemented. Mansfield Oil, Mansfield Energy Companies, are an eight plus billion dollar um, energy related firm. Most of their uh, transactions come from shipping fuel around the, around the country, North America. Um, they have <laughs> tankers that pick up oil at uh, you know, loading docks around the, around, and ports and such, and they'll transport fuel to tanks all over the country. They have tanker cars that move around everywhere. They have giant tank farms at, at places like UPS where the, you know, the central distribution sites for a lot of large enterprises store their fuel and they distribute their fuel. They have relationships with state entities and various government entities where they provide fuel. So they, um, they're, they're a very sophisticated company. They have a sophisticated IT department. They, um, they're used to cloud-based platforms. They're already fully you know, Office 365. Um, implemented. They have hosting sites um, for their main computers. They're familiar with dealing with ADFS and how to integrate with Azure. All of this helps us immensely. It made them a very natural candidate for the, uh, the TAP program, the Technology Adoption Program at Microsoft. And they also had a very specific focus. They wanted to implement AR, AP, GL, fixed assets, uh, budgets, so finance. Um, they have fuel management systems. They handle all the transactions. They have, like, uh, the Mansfield Power and Gas is a utility company that provides, uh, ut you know, energy services to commercial enterprises. So they have all those operating systems that manage those businesses. But they wanted a new central platform to consolidate all of the uh, the, the receivable and payable data from all those various operating entities around the world. And they wanted to be able to, you know, typical AX needs. You want to use Management Reporter for consolidated financials and uh, consolidations and eliminations. You want to use the AX fixed assets so you have a consistent fixed asset, you know, package for all your entities. They want to be able to upload their budgets and do budget reporting against the financials and the, ac and the uh, actual transactions that are going through the system. So we had a nice defined focus. So it's always nice when you're doing a, an ERP system implementation if you know exactly why you're doing it and the scope of your implementation. So 
in order to have a successful implementation, you always want to know exactly what you're doing before you start and what is the exact scope of it. How many, ent how many entities are we doing? Do you know what your chart of accounts should look like? Do you know exactly when you're going to go live? In, in the case of Mansfield, a, a classic perfect example of what we want to implement. I, I know exactly who I'm going to implement, who, who my customers are, where they're based, exactly what date we wanted to go live on. We wanted to go live on May 1. So we started this project um, about a year earlier. And we were in the, uh, we chose to go to the Microsoft TAP program in uh, August, late August, early September. So we switched from an AX2012 to an AX7. I guess now we call it the new AX, new AX2016, otherwise known as AX7. I think that's how we're supposed to call it. So that's, that's a little background into, into Mansfield. So now let's get to the actual stuff we're interested in. So AX7 is cloud-based. Um, a lot of people want to know what does cloud-based mean. You guys hopefully, you know, all have an answer to what cloud-based means. But to me, it means that you don't host servers in a local environment that you maintain. So the client is not a thick client, it's a browser-based client. The servers themselves are hosted on like an internet source platform. Um, in the case of uh, AX7, the servers are all hosted on Azure. Microsoft manages the production environment right now, though there, I understand there will be a, an on-prem option available toward the end of the year, or early next year. But right now you have to deploy it on a public Azure cloud platform that Microsoft maintains. Um, you can have private um, cloud environments for development and testing, but before you can deploy out, well, we'll talk more about Azure and what it meant, how, how it's put together in terms of an AX7 deployment a little bit later. But so for, for the purposes of the application AX7, it's cloud-based, the AOS, the SQL Server, all the back-end tools run on Azure. The client is browser-based. Um, the Visual Studio development environment is now being used. And there's a lot of myths about uh, AX7 and the development. Uh, I've heard it said that AX was X++ was thrown away. It's not. It's still there. It's still the exact same X++ it's always been. It's just now ported to Visual Studio. So you have the, the Visual Studio environment to do development and debug and build screens. And you can use the Application Explorer. And you can use the Solution Explorer. And you can step through your code. All the tools that are available for a Visual Studio type development project are now available for X++. You'll notice over here, this is the uh, Application Explorer. I kind of put a brief picture up here. That's what the old AOT, when you went into AX2012 or AX2009 and you brought up the AOT, it's now called the Application Explorer in Visual Studio. So um, I look here, I've got like a data model. And here are the tables. And if I exploded the tables out, I could see the fields. So and now in, in uh, AX7, you're working in Visual Studio. It's much easier to get to these objects. It's much easier to create a project and include objects from the Application Explorer in your project and extend them. You now have the ability to uh, create uh, you know, development packages that you can deploy and compile as DLLs. Um, so I don't necessarily have to bring the entire AOS down and reboot it. It runs in IS7. It's a very mature technology for web, you know, as a web host platform. And just like ASP.NET or any other web development environment, um, I can deploy individual DLLs. So you have a, a base set of code for AX7, which Microsoft gives you, and a base set of data entities, which are now how you access data. And if, and if you want to make changes, you extend those. I can create a new project. I could create a new form. I, I make a menu, and I add a menu to go to my new form. If I want to just rebuild that form and deploy that form by itself as a DLL, I can. I don't have to recompile the entire application and do a giant you know, code merge. Um, it actually is much easier now to do uh, low-level changes in Visual Studio and deploy just that without having to have an entire outage or you know, risk of if impacting large code bases. In the deployment into the production environments in AX7, you, you now create deployment packages. And we'll talk about LCS in a little bit, but you go through LCS to do your deployments. Interestingly enough, everything's on a virtual machine now when you want to get to it. So since it's hosted on Azure, if you want to work in SQL Server or Visual Studio, when you deploy the AX environment, you're going to, they're going to deploy a series of virtual machines. Like for example, there's one virtual machine in a, in a multi-server uh, topology that has the SQL Server on it and the SSRS server. So I can actually hop on that server, 
to, uh, to make changes to my environment. The, the development environment is typically one server that has the SQL server on it, and it has the IS7 on it, and it has all the tools that are in one environment, including Visual Studio. So um, you, you deploy that, and then you can uh, go straight to it through an RDP connection. Typically, you're going to go into LCS to connect to it. But um, that means I can hop on the virtual machine for development. Now, what that does mean is if I have five developers, I have to deploy five development VMs. And because it's Azure-based, even if it's a private cloud Azure-based, under your EA agreement where you have some control of the cost, you are deploying environments under Azure. There are monthly click charges now acquiring every time you, you deploy a development environment. At IBIS, because we have an ISV product and we've been, doing, we've, we've been working on AX7 for uh, well over a year and a half, we have private deployments on individual machines, but that's not how Microsoft wants everybody else to do it. So if, you, if you're a, a user and you deploy a development environment, you're going to deploy it through LCS it's going to be deployed on your Azure subscription. So you have to have an Azure subscription. You need an Office 365 account and you need to have Azure. And then you'll deploy dev environment and you'll hop on the VM and do it and your developers do all that work. Now the positive side of that is that um, it, it takes a couple of hours to deploy a new environment. When you go into LCS, you pick the template you want to deploy, you push a button, you go to dinner and you come back four hours later and you have a dev environment. SQL's up, SSRS is fully configured, Visual Studio is fully installed, all the tools are there. You just go grab your package out of your TFS library and away you go, the new developer can go. So when you have a new developer you, would appoint, you want to put on staff, your partner or you guys if you've been trained on it, you can deploy a new development environment in less than five hours. So you should be able to do it overnight and they can work the next morning. If you've you know, been working with AX2012 or 2009, it is substantially harder to bring up a new development environment. You've got to go through the entire build process of getting the right SQL Server version with the right, you know, the right service packs, and then you've got to have the right version of SSRS and the right version of Management Reporter and the right version. All that's gone now. You pick a template, you push a deploy button, you put in your Azure subscription ID, and wham, five hours later, there's your full environment ready to go, including security. So. I can't tell you how nice that is when you're going through these development, when you're going through a deployment project and you want to deploy a new environment to just, hey James, can I have a new dev environment tomorrow? And next thing you know, I come in the next morning, there's a new dev environment. I'm like, can you give access to this guy? And there you go, it's all done. Um, the amount of stress that takes out of a deployment project is unbelievable. Uh, the only downside to that is if you don't keep an eye on it, you end up with 15 environments out there on your Azure subscription and then the IT director comes and yells at you. So I would recommend keeping a good handle on the number of environments you've deployed and whether you actually use them or not. Because if somebody wants a test environment, well, I can throw a test environment out. It only takes me a few hours and I have to just take my dev code and combine it with my, my gold environment and deploy them out there. And so in a day, I can build an entire new test environment. And then it sits out there for months and nobody's used it and you're paying Azure subscription fees on it the whole time, which Microsoft loves. They like that model. They don't mind if you forget they're out there. But, but you shouldn't do it. It does get expensive. Um, the other thing, um, you use Active Directory Federation services now for integrating your local environments to Azure to make sure that uh, your, your printers connect and your emails, which are going out through Office 365, all work, and that your users, when they're at home and they want to log into the URL and they, they, they're they're, they're connected through your uh, you know, distributed network to your own network. All of that is worked out, your IT department, the geniuses behind it will use ADFS. So no matter where I am, I can connect to my, my uh, AX7 browser and not have to re-log in over and over and over. And when I want to print, it'll go to my printer at work. And when I want to email, it'll go out through my regular email account. I was very surprised at how well that worked. Um, the first time we did it, it took us a couple of days to figure out how to use the printer setup tool to get all my network printers um, connected to all of the users' sessions. But once we figured it out, it was extremely easy. It works extremely well. And, and on the positive side about AX7, the technologies they're using are all mature. ADFS is mature. IS7 is mature. The new SQL 2016, um, it's, it's an enhancement on SQL Server, but it's still the same SQL Server that's always been out there. It's just a lot faster and it's now designed to run specifically on Azure. So the version of SQL Server 2016 that's used for AX in the cloud is specific to Azure. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later too. Um, oh, I'm going to move on. What am I supposed to talk about next? Ah, 
we're going to talk about life cycle services. So if you're not familiar with life cycle services and you want to go to AX7, you will become familiar with life cycle services. Um, among the many things, I, you know, I can point to a few things out here. Um, these are environments, for example. Um, I think this was our RTW build prod for Mansfield Oil. This is a dev environment. This is a, I can pick one of these environments and it'll list all the VMs that are behind it and all the resources if there's been any errors that have been issued. Um, I can monitor the status of those environments in LCS. So I could, I could pick an environment by clicking on that and then I could pick a server that I want to look at and then I could hop on the server through RDP or I could look at the health or the status of the server. I could, you know, I, I, I can use, there are features in LCS to let you submit tickets. Um, as a matter of fact, if you go with AX7, during, your, during the project as you're implementing, you will be using LCS to submit issues um, to, to Microsoft that need resolution from Microsoft. Um, it has uh, like the business process modeler now. In, in AX7, I'm sorry, the new AX2016, otherwise known as AX7, the business process modeler is used to identify we have fits and gaps. So for example, um, if I wanted to look at my accounts payable process from the point where I entered um, an expense and then it went through workflow to get approved and then I create a payment proposal to uh, issue checks and then I write checks. That process, I can go through the business process modeler and say here's are all the steps and if there's a gap in the process, say I have a, I need um, a document attached as part of the workflow approval process, that would be a gap. It's not in the delivered AX standard workflow. Um, the business process model, it looks kind of, you know, it's like a graph chart. It's got a process, a decision tree, and so it's the old standard flow chart type model. And I say here, this is a gap. Well, now I can attach task recordings to elements in the business process model. And I can use that business process model to, to list all of my gaps and descriptions behind my gaps. And then I can run task recordings of things. So I now actually have um, context sensitive help in the new AX2016, formerly known as AX7. So when I get to a screen and I'm performing a function and I hit F1, if I have built one of these business processes and I have attached my task recordings to it, um, then it'll pop up a task recording list. These are the available task recordings for the form you're on. And the new task recorder is really cool because after you go through and record it, um, you can go back and you can put like little bubbles on things. Like you can put a bubble that aims at a field and said, this field is for you to enter this, you know, the, the, uh, the vendor's invoice date. And this field is for you to enter the vendor's invoice amount. And this is for the discount. So the bubble will actually go down the screen field to field as they tab through. So the new task recorder is really cool. As a matter of fact, um, if you really want to cheat, you can use it as a macro because it will shove the data back in there for you. Well, there's one version of it. You can go through and you can fill out everything while, while you're recording the task. And when you save it, there's a version that takes a lot of data. When you save it, it's a big file. But it'll shove back in the data. So you can actually use it as a macro. I could go record me entering one invoice. And if I had 1,000 invoices that were exactly the same, I could just replay the task recorder and it'll shove them all back in. So. Um, but you can't get it to do context-sensitive help if you haven't used LCS and you haven't created the business process models and identified how, which forms those task, uh, task recordings attach to. Um, one of the really cool things about LCS now, as I mentioned earlier, I referred to it earlier, is um, when you want to deploy an environment, you go into LCS. And there's a, a profiler in here that you need to fill out before you can deploy a production or a high availability test environment wants to know about how many users are there, what types of transactions are you doing, how many transactions are you processing an hour, how many transactions a year, do you do eight hours a day, do you do 24 hours a day, what's your support like? They use that to figure out how much equipment they need to deploy when you push out a production or a high availability test environment. So when I go in LCS, I have to fill out the profiler, and then I want to deploy an environment, there's a, there's a button on here, let you pick, I want to deploy an environment. And it's going to ask you, do you want a dev environment, a training environment, a test environment, a prod environment? And you pick which one you want. And it's going to ask you to put in your Azure subscription ID. And you know you have to have Azure and you have to have a subscription ID. So you put that in. And it's going to come back and give you a certificate number. And then you go to your IT department and you say, hey, here's my certificate number. Go plug this into your Azure account. And they'll bring up their Azure management thing. And they'll plug that in. And they're going to get another key back. And you're going to come back to LCS and you put that key in. Well, that's how you link up LCS with your Azure so that it puts your deployment into your Azure account 
and deploys VM servers under your Azure ID. When you go to a production deployment, it's a little different, um, but this is how you build dev and test environments that are on your private Azure cloud. Now, when you go to the public deployment, Microsoft is going to deploy that for you. Um, as a matter of fact, in the, in the new, um, the new AX2016, formerly known as AX7, um, the public cloud version for production environments, you can't touch. I can't touch. The partner can't touch. Only Microsoft touches it because they're guaranteeing you uptime and they're deploying their disaster recovery for you. And um, if in, in, and I get this, in their mind, if they allow us to go in there and play with it, then they don't have complete control of it, and how can they be held responsible for 100% uptime or 99.99998, whatever it is they have in their, their, um, their support agreements. They, so um, when you want to deploy something, you have to deploy it to a high availability test environment and test it. And the exact package you deploy to that, you give to Microsoft and they deploy to production. But you have to, you know, swear to God that I de this is the exact application I deployed and we tested it and it's all good to go and you give it to them and they deploy it. And they will actually verify that you did the testing because they don't want to deploy something that's going to break the production environment because once again, they're on the hook for it. Um, so obviously this all has a, a large impact on, on your deployment uh, when, when you're creating your new environment and you're, you're migrating your code over and you're, you're building your configurations and all that stuff. So now I've given you kind of a background into how AX7 works and how it's built and the environments and how people get to it. Um, now let's talk about some, uh, what AX7, how it works. Because we're going to get into now the actual users and their user experience, how I get data into it, how I integrate with it. I'm not going to, you know, I can't go into detail, we don't have a lot of time, but um, AX is, this is kind of what it looks like, right? This is looking at AX. It's browser based. And I can click on this menu over here and it drops down a menu. And while it looks very different from AX 2009 or 2012, as soon as you figure out where the differences are, you realize it's the same thing. It has all the exact same features. They've deprecated a few things, but most of the features have come straight over. Um, because X++ did not change, they ported the code. So the background things, anything that ran on the AOS, they just ported the code over. Um, it's not really a rewrite. It's an interface change. So for example, uh, the, uh, the, the fixed asset depreciation calculation, which runs on the AOS, that's the exact same code, didn't change. The change is all this, anything that was in the UI. So if there was a validation that was in the user interface, well, that had to get changed because there's a whole new UI. So um, Sonata helped them build these tools that migrate all the code over. So they have these tools that migrated the code from the old AX over to the new AX. And um, then, then they spent the last year going through and testing it to make sure every field does exactly what it's supposed to do. And you'll notice when you go in like the accounts receivable parameter setup form, it's the same form, it just has a much better layout. It's a, it works faster, but the same options are there. You're not going to be confused as to where do I go set up, uh, you know, the posting profile for a, a customer group. It's in this, you just go find your customers and you go to customer groups and you go to that customer group setup form and you expand your fast tabs and there it is right there, same way it always was. Um, it does run faster. The new fully compiled DLLs in IIS 7 and running on the Azure with the SQL 2016 Azure in the background, in my opinion, it's much faster. I don't have any uh, specific technical data to back that up, but I, no one is complaining to us as we're processing 60,000 transactions a day. No one's saying, hey, it's, it's not. It was at first, when we first implemented it, the first couple of weeks we were having issues, but Microsoft has bent over backwards um, to make sure that the TAP customers like Mansfield are fully supported. We have teams of engineers who just drop everything and go run and figure out, well, why didn't that work right? So now after a, a month and a half of running, um, it, we, it all works. We have very few errors, um, there's very few performance issues. Um, as a matter of fact, if anybody wants to talk to Mansfield about this, we'll be happy to, to let you guys talk to Mansfield about their experience on going live. They're willing to do that. I just have to, I, I can't give you everybody's contact information and have you call them randomly. But if you want to talk to them, you're welcome to call us or, you know, ask me and we'll set up a, a, a direct meeting so you can talk to them about it. Um, a couple of things that are interesting for implementation. So I usually have a legacy system. Um, even if you're migrating from 2009 up to um, AX7, there's got to be some process to get old data into the new system. So if you're going from 
um, to GP or one of the other you know, legacy accounting packages or, or if you're implementing retail or HR or whatever. You've got to port that data over. Um, the, the new DIXF, you, it's familiar, except one thing you have to remember about everything in AX7 now, the new AX2016, formerly known as AX7, is um, you get the data through data entities, which means uh, where before the programmers, and you can still go behind the scenes in the dev environments and play and look at the tables. The table structure didn't change. It's still the same table, still the same fields. They do the same thing they always did. Um, but Microsoft wants you to get to data through these things called data entities. Now, data entities have been around for a while in AX, but they're now much more enforced. So if I want to look at an invoice table, I have to look at the invoice data entity. And data entities are security aware. So when I, when I, if I expose a data entity through an OData feed so that it can be consumed from Excel or Power BI, if I'm not supposed to get to manufacturing data as a user, I can't see it. All right, so I shouldn't say data entities themselves aren't security aware, but when you expose them through the tools Microsoft provides to expose them, they become security aware. So users can't get the data they don't want to. Um, you use data entities when you're building forms. You use data entities when you import data, when you export data. So um, you'll see over here, I'm looking, this is a data import form. I'm creating an import job. I said I'm going to be importing customer data. The source data is in a CSV format, and I'd pick a, a customer um, data entity. Or if, if I had some additional fields I've added to the customer table, I might have extended the customer data entity, and I might have a, you know, a, an IBIS customer entity out there. I would pick that. And, and when you create these import projects, I, it'll import this, um, this table and let me map the fields to my data entities. Then I can save that mapping. And I can have compound or complex data entities that pull this customer combined with this invoice data combined with this GL data is this really obnoxious compound. I can import data a lot. So I can create compound complex data entities and import data into them. But then the mapping can become kind of difficult. So when you're going through the migration process, um, you're hoping that you get to use delivered data entities to lower your costs. And in most cases, the delivered data entities will support my migrating customers and vendors and open AR and open AP and inventory items and, and purchase orders. Um, sometimes you may have to extend them. You may have some, some special field or elements that you need to add to your import process. But generally speaking, you can get the data into the system fairly easily by building these import maps and, and using uh, DIXF. Sometimes what you want to do is too complicated or you've built modifications or customizations that have to be supported. What we're generally doing is we're building web services for doing those integrations because the new web services in this model are shockingly fast. I'm familiar with the old handshake issues with web services where it takes me five seconds of transactions. There's no way I can use that to import um, 250,000 records. Um, the new ones, we're, we're pulling 40,000 records in in 10 minutes through a web service, which is astonishing to me. My, you know, it's the first time I've ever heard of you being able to process those kind of transaction volumes through web services. So if you're familiar with AIF and using the old AIF to build web services, it's very similar. Um, new developers will have no issues with figuring it out. Um, and, and the web services are deployed in the environment just like they were in 2012. You know, it's a, it's a completely browser-based, cloud-based application. Um, so it, it makes sense that you would do most of your, at least in our, our mind, you do most of your integrations through web services if it wasn't a simple file import and export type process. So that's what we did. Um, and we found it was very fast, very reliable. Really quick, I want to talk about a couple of the down, uh, positives and negatives about Azure. Um, we talked about Azure subscriptions, dev and test environments already. High availability environments that you're going to use for production. The Microsoft, you're going to have multiple SQL servers. You're going to have multiple AOS servers. You're going to have multiple environments that are low leveling. And if you choose to purchase it, Microsoft will set up geographically diverse disaster recovery sites. So the new SQL Server 2016 for Azure is very, very much Azure focused. You can't do replication the way you've always done it in SQL Server, where you can specify tables and fields. The replication now is more like a page layer replication. It's very fast, it's very background, and you don't get to pick what's replicated. Right? That means everybody in the old SQL, they, we, we always like to use replication as a way of building a reporting environment. So we would replicate certain tables and certain fields onto a SQL Server, and then we would make all the reports hit that other server. 
Um, we might have replication use for disaster recovery also, but we tended to use it for, as a way to get our, report, our reporting users off of our primary application. We can't do that anymore. Um, you have to use data entities to export your data. So that's one of the downsides of Azure because it's so focused on performance and, and being up all of the time. And when disaster recovery has to be implemented, it has to be implemented fast, and Microsoft is the one who's supporting it now, so they want to be in control of it, so they don't let you get to the data behind the scenes. It, it has an impact on your ability to control and manipulate data. So now you have to use data entities and either export the data and import them into your own um, you know, data dictionaries or data warehouses, or you can use OData feeds. There are some issues with that. There, you, you can have performance issues when you start trying to export 70,000 rows through OData. Um, and if you're not familiar with all these terms, and I know I'm getting real term heavy here, um, we'll be happy to talk to you about what all these things mean in more depth. If you have an existing partner, they can describe all these things. Um, or you can just go browse around and look for terms like OData on the web, and you know, you'll get more information than you ever wanted to know. Um, another issue about exporting data is the new Excel import in AX7 is capping you at 2,000 rows. So if you wanted to pull a big list um, and you customize your list, have just the fields you want, and it turns out it has 2,500 rows, but well, those last 500 rows aren't coming out. So you have to have another method for getting your data out to Excel. It's not hard to build those other methods, but you're going to have to be aware of that as you go through your implementation process. Any forms where the user might want to export a list to Excel to manipulate them, if, if it's going to be over, if it's possible to go over 2,000 rows, you have to deal with that as a separate issue. All right, now, I have run over my time. Um, and I want to be able to ask people to ask questions because I'm, I'm sure you're interested in this.